Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour. This is your host, Bill Fresson. We're talking today to Michelle Minton, a fellow in consumer policy studies from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, otherwise known, I think, as our SIN scholar. Michelle follows gambling, alcohol, and in particular recently wrote a piece called Prohibition Hangover, Cure for Keystone State Brewers, which is about the changing beer distribution laws in the state of Pennsylvania. Michelle, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. So, Michelle, answer, answer the question of all time, where does beer come from? Where does beer come from? Well, a few <laughs> key ingredients, yeast, water, barley, or some other kind of grain, and hops. It's been with us a long time, hasn't uh-huh. it? Yeah. I mean, some would say it's uh, you know, a gift from God that shows he loves us, but uh, I'm a bigger fan of you know, our ancient cave ancestors kind of stumbled upon some fermented barley or something, and uh, poof, there we had this wonderful beverage that potentially created society as we know it. A lot of people argue that it was beer that caused people to start farming in the first place. It is older, it is older than wine, that's true, and it, and it certainly goes back to the earliest days of civilization. And how long have people been trying to control its distribution? Uh, basically since the beginning, <laughs> beginning excuse me, um, uh, Hammurabi's Code actually has a note about uh, serving alcohol and how tavern owners could be drowned if they if they cheated their customers. Ah, uh-huh. so it was, a, it was a, a truth in labeling laws in the beginning. Mm-hmm. And I guess Germany still has some very famous beer laws, does it not? They no longer have Reinheimsgebot, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is the German purity law, which says they can only have, well, originally it said they could only have barley, hops, and water because they didn't know that yeast existed. They didn't know what it was until, uh, you know, a little mm-hmm. bit later than that, and they added yeast into the purity law. But I think that was rescinded in the 80s or the 90s. A lot of German brewers still adhere to that, but with the boom in craft beer, especially that's happened in America, the Germans have really picked up on this adding creative ingredients into their beer. Well, considering the stuff I used to drink in college 40 years ago, it really is amazing how far beer has come. Just uh, in the last five years, it's, yeah. It's, well, it, lately it's unbelievable. And of course, as, as craft beers have gotten more and more interesting, I've fallen back and pretty much only drink Guinness. But but that's uh, maybe a sign of, of age. But tell us, I guess we're celebrating the 80th anniversary of the repeal of Prohibition. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a time where it was illegal to get, uh, get hold of beer. And when they lifted Prohibition, uh, they left some laws behind, which I understand are still with us. Maybe you can take us back to those days and paint a picture of how we got to where we are. Sure. Well, just very quickly, a lot of people, you know, in the 20s when alcohol consumption was uh, seen to be too much, excessive in this country, a lot of people believed that the reason it was that way, that people were drinking so much, was because distillers, brewers, and winemakers could own the places that sold their product. And they believed that they had this incentive to make people drink as much of their product as as possible. Uh, Whether or not that is actually what, well, most merchants uh, want people to consume their products. I mean, there, there's got to be some truth in that. Well, right. But, but the idea that a merchant who was separated from the production, so, you know, uh, now we have this three-tiered system in most states. Uh, it was sort of a compromise when prohibition was lifted that, you know, you had this system and they said, if we separate the people who make the alcohol from the people who sell the alcohol, you won't have this problem. I think that's a misconception because I mean, it's a tavern owner wants people to drink as much as possible, too, so that they can make, you know, a profit. Yeah, I would, I would think the justification is, is strange indeed. But uh, again, tell us about this three-tier system that is still with us in most states. So when prohibition was repealed with the enactment of the 21st Amendment, it didn't necessarily get rid of prohibition. All it did was give the power of regulating alcoholic beverages to the states. Hmm. So the states had to separately get rid of prohibition in their own way over time. And what we've seen, if you look around at the the environments of beer laws or alcohol laws that still exist, uh, many of prohibition's laws continue to last. I mean, Mississippi and Alabama have just now lifted the prohibition on home brewing just last year. And there are still dry counties, plenty of dry counties oh, out there. Oh, Alabama's probably half dry still right. at this point. And Georgia as well is slowly becoming more wet. Uh, the three-tiered system, every state pretty much has its own version of the three-tiered. So in Pennsylvania, for example, the state is the distributor. The state buys liquor and sells it out of state stores. It's one mm-hmm. of the only places you can – it's the only place you can buy hard liquor. And wine is starting to loosen up in that state. 
you know, you can buy it in, in a few grocery stores, but mostly it's still just state stores. Mm-hmm. And beer, you can really only buy it in bars and from distributors. So the distributors are this middle tier that was created by this three-tiered system. Uh, I'm sure there were some distributors that existed before Prohibition, people who shipped the beer or the liquor or the wine to stores and restaurants from where it was produced. You know, forget forget the temperance justifications. What were the what were the economic justifications? You know, this was the the age of of real deep economic interventionism, which is back upon us. What were the what were the economic rationales for doing this? People didn't talk about it too often, but one of the justifications that was brought up for having the three tiered system was that it kept prices high for alcohol, and that if brewers, for example, uh, got into wars, uh, pricing wars with each other, alcohol could fall so low that people just wouldn't be able to control themselves because it's just so cheap <laughs> and they could drink as much as they wanted to or you know, more than they wanted to. Again, that's a justification uh, that today we would say, wait a minute, you are trying to keep prices high? It's something that we would step, I think a lot of consumers would step back and say, well, well I don't know. taxes yeah. do? Isn't 40% of the cost of a beer taxed these days? Yeah, there's plenty of taxes on alcohol to keep the prices <laughs> just high, you know, high enough. Wasn't there concern about concentration of power in one in one part of the distribution channel or another? Either there were too many too, the brewers were too strong or the distributors were too strong and they were trying to balance between the two? Yeah, part of the reason that there is this three tiered system, besides the the tied house rule, which I talked about, was, you know, uh, tavern owners pushing so much of their produced alcohol on people, there was this argument that because brewers and distilleries and wine, wineries had been gone for so long during prohibition and the bootleggers had really become very powerful that if you know if we just unregulated it or if we just legalized everything again the bootleggers would take over uh, and they would have a monopoly on the market so mm. this system would have the people producing the alcohol separated from the distributors which some of them were prior bootleggers who became the distributors, uh, that that would somehow create a, a more fair market because, you know, there were only, if you look at just the beer market, there were only maybe three breweries that were able to start production on beer again right after, pro- right. Yeah, right after Prohibition. And wasn't Joseph Kennedy one of the big distributors, one of the big alcohol distributors right after Prohibition? From what I know, Joseph Kennedy was, he knew, well, everybody knew that the end was coming and he definitely got his ducks in order so that he could get right into the game. So let's go into the paper you, you published in December, specifically about changes that are taking place or might be taking place in Pennsylvania. Tell us about those. Well, so the paper looks at this bill, uh, Representative Tobosh in Pennsylvania introduced. And what that would do is change the way that franchises are organized. So beer franchises are wholesalers who distribute beer. And like I said, this three-tiered system exists in most states. Mm-hmm. And most states also have franchise protection laws that protect those wholesalers, that middle tier, the reason that franchise laws exist supposedly was to help the wholesalers have more power when they make contracts with their mm-hmm. beer producers. And is it correct that once you sign a, a contract with a beer distributor, you're, you're his for life? Pretty much. Most, most laws, most state laws make it virtually impossible for a brewer to end his contract, his or her, her contract with a wholesaler uh, unless they can really prove just cause. And usually even then they have to go to court and spend a lot of money to prove it. That must do wonders for customer service. Well, right. So, you know, with these franchise protection laws, it, there's also geographic monopoly power or geographic monopoly laws, which say that a brewer is legally prohibited from having more than one distributor in any given area. So there's no competition between distributors for a particular brand. So there really is uh, quite a bit of monopoly in within the market. So they carve the basically they carve the market up and hand it out to the various cronies. Uh, I know I lived in Pennsylvania for 20 years, and every time a new governor came in, he would promise to reform the alcohol distribution laws, and people were very excited about that. And it wasn't long before most of his relatives were running it and nothing changed. Is there any chance that that these new bills can actually get passed? There is. I think there's a real thirst, to be punny, uh, in the states for reform of alcohol laws, specifically Pennsylvania, because it's become such a big story, these laws that we've had on the books since the 20s, (laughs) uh, like the Jonestown tax, which... It's it's a town that was flooded, and there was a liquor mm-hmm. tax that was instituted to help pay for the town's recovery. Temporary tax. A temporary tax that is still existing today, even mm-hmm. though the amount of money could have paid for that town. Or the town has actually been rebuilt several times, I believe, since the tax, tax was instituted. It's, it's not necessary, but it still exists. Well, that's the nature of taxes. Nothing tends to be more permanent than yeah. that. And how did the uh, brew pubs get around all this? Because uh, very often you'll see... Uh, not everywhere, but you'll see uh, brew pubs that are brewing their own product on-premise and selling directly to the public. Yes, that's that's one of the first people 
the, one of the first things people talk about when they hear this, that there's a three-tiered system that's supposed to separate the producer from the distributor of alcohol. This is these brew pubs. How do they get around it? Almost all states, uh, I would say probably at least 70% of the states, have some kind of exclusion law that says, you know, if you are a small brew pub, you are allowed to brew X amount of barrels a year and distribute that from your premise. So you're allowed to sell to people. Some states don't allow those brew pubs to sell it to customers to take off the premise. Some of them do allow the brew pubs to even sell to wholesalers so that they can distribute a certain amount of barrels per year within a geographical area. It, it varies state by state, but those laws had to be put in that, that give them uh, an exemption from the three-tiered system. And there's no federal preemption here. This is a state's rights issue. Pretty much it's, any state can do as it pleases in this area. Absolutely. It's 100 percent a state's right issue. So which, which, which states, if you make a spectrum of states, which states are the most competitive and most free with respect to uh, beer distribution? Well, with beer distribution, it would probably be California has some pretty liberal laws. How about New Hampshire, right around the, right no, over the border? No, New Hampshire? I don't think so. No. Uh, I think actually New Hampshire had run into a little bit of problems. They have some interesting licensing. It's either New Hampshire or Connecticut where they have a farmer brewer law, uh, which basically means if, if you're a brewer and you're making under a certain number of barrels per year and you use uh, New Hampshire ingredients, you can pay uh, maybe $500 a year for your license to distribute and you can self-distribute up to you know a certain number of barrels a year. But the, uh, the liquor control board in New Hampshire tried to say that they would have to use 80% or 70% Mm -hmm. New Hampshire ingredients, which is difficult because hops aren't grown in New Hampshire. It would have been impossible. You need greenhouses, I guess, for it. Right. So that basically would have eliminated farmer brewers, which would have meant that these small brewers would have to pay, I think it was like $10,000 a year, and they wouldn't be able to self-distribute anymore. So it was the people were up in arms, and it was quickly taken off the table. Doesn't the Interstate Commerce Clause say something about that? Can they really pass a law that favors uh, folks who use local ingredients? Uh, yeah, you absolutely can do that as long as you don't like you're not discriminating. Well, for example, Pennsylvania's run into some problems where they say a in-state brewer can self-distribute but an out-of-state brewer cannot. Now, that is that does violate the Commerce Clause. But to say that someone who's a New Hampshire resident has this specific kind of licensure, you know, this, this licensing scheme, uh, okay. it, 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 that's not exactly anti-competitive, it. yeah. So what is the status of, of Representative Tobesh's bill? Is it, uh, is it coming up for a vote soon? It's just in committee right now, so the committee has to approve the bill. I'm not sure if they'll get around to that by the end of the year. I hope so. Uh, if they approve that, you know, then they'll kick it to the House and then... T- the General Assembly will get a chance to vote on it. What the bill does really is, you know, we were talking about that agreement between wholesalers and brewers in perpetuity. Uh, Sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. it lasts even beyond the wholesaler's life or the brewer's life. It can be passed down to their children. An inheritance. Yes, it it does. It it can be Uh inherited. Well, so what Tobosh's bill would do is make it very clear that if the you know, if the brewer sells his brew, I'm sorry, if the uh, wholesaler sells his his, Mm -hmm. um, distributorship, then the Brewer can have a chance to buy it out or, or end the contract. Also, it lays out all of these standards for just cause for them to break the contract. Like if the wholesaler loses a permit, if they fail to meet the provisions of their agreement, you know, there's some kind of standard right. of performance where they could say, I'm giving you 30 days notice. Here's fair market value for our, for our beer Whatever and we're done. Is. We're done with it. Yeah, well, fair market value, um, they say in the bill, in Tobosh's bill, it would be determined by the amount of money another wholesaler would be willing to pay uh, without you know, coercion. Right, right. You're going to magically determine what that is. It sounds like baby steps. It really doesn't sound like uh, a big bang here. It is. It's. It's. But what it would do is it would force the wholesalers to really take into consideration what their brewers want. Because right now they really don't have to worry too much about the brewers because they, they can't go anywhere. Right. So this really gives the brewers an opportunity to make them sit down and say, we want better terms or we'd like you to perform better or do something different. So where are the big commercial brewers on this, Anheuser-Busch and, and the others? Are they Sometimes peculiar things happen. Are they Mm. in favor of this kind of deregulation or are they against it? Uh, I haven't spoken directly to them, but I would I would assume that because Anheuser and Miller Coors have been trying to reform franchise laws for decades, that they would be supportive of this. This really wouldn't help them because they don't have, uh, you know, a brewery in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. But they might if this passed, they very well might in um, uh, in Missouri. Anheuser-Busch has been trying very hard, has been fighting a, a 
a legal battle to get out of the contract with the distributor they've had for many, many years, and they've so far been unsuccessful. So they definitely want to reform these kind of laws. Is there a lot of lobbying going on, on around this bill, or is it pretty much uh, all happening in back rooms right now? It's probably happening in back rooms. I can't see that there's too much. I, I know that the small brewers, because most of the brewers in Pennsylvania are small, so the mm-hmm. smaller and middle-sized brewers in Pennsylvania are, are definitely in support of this bill. They want to see it happen. How much lobbying they're doing, I couldn't say. And I, I guess except for the distributors who want to hold on to their monopoly just as a taxi uh, a company would want to hold on to its taxi medallions, who else is lining up on, on the side of not changing the law? I would think the prohibitionists are gone by now. No, no. There's still plenty of people who are skittish about liberalizing alcohol laws at all. They don't want to see the prices fall. They don't want to see alcohol become more available. They've spoken out. But, but the most vociferous are really the distributors and their employees because their employees mm, okay. are paid pretty well and they don't want to see any uh, a good threat. thing going. Why, yeah. why, uh, why upset the apple cart? And where's the voice of the consumer in all this? Well, uh, the consumers don't really know about this. There hasn't been a whole lot of coverage, and it's such an esoteric topic that uh, you know it's very complex. The consumers have been fairly quiet, but one of the arguments that I've been making is that small distributors and people who are in the distribution business should actually really like this bill because it makes it much more likely that more distributors can get into the Pennsylvania market. Because as it is now, if you wanted to be a distributor and you're starting up and you say, well, I want to distribute... Yeah, it's difficult to break in because all of the brewers are already under these lock and key contracts. Ah, okay. So getting an established brand is, is very difficult. So again, the incumbents, the big incumbents who want to pass it down to their children, the ones who want to hold on to this and, and keep it from, from changing. Exactly. Has anyone done an estimate on what this adds to the price of a case of beer? Well, I this particular bill, no, but the but franchising laws and taxes, they make up more than half the cost of a beer. Uh, taxes alone, if you just look at the federal excise tax, the state excise taxes, and business taxes, makes up about 45% of the cost of a beer. But then that gets us into the whole syntax argument, right, which is that there's a social utility mm-hmm. in raising the cost of activities that – folks don't want people to engage in, and the money could perhaps be used to mitigate the consequences of alcoholism or, or uh, you know, whichever gambling uh, that, that, you're, that you're taxing. And that's a separate set of argument than mm-hmm. cartelization of the industry. Oh, yes, definitely. And I mean, we've done studies here at CEI. There was a, a study we did last year called the Wages of Sin Taxes, which really looked at different states, different countries that have levels of taxation on cigarettes, alcohol, uh, and sugary foods. And from what we've seen, Raising the taxes on on alcoholic beverages really does not diminish the uh, amount of the amount of consumption. Well, for the people who are extreme users, the people who really cause the problems that they say they're trying that their taxes are meant to mitigate aren't really affected by the taxes. All that happens is people who don't have a lot of money end up spending a greater portion of their income on these products. So it's really or you a buy cheapest stuff. You can't you can't buy the good stuff. Yeah, that too. Yeah, it's but it is really uh, sin taxes are always regressive, and they, they very rarely modify consumer behavior at all. So, Michelle, I understand there's a bill somewhere in Congress to reduce the federal excise tax on on beer. Is that making any progress? Yes. Well, there are two beer. Uh, there are two bills actually. Uh, there's the Beer Act and the Small Brew Act, and the Small Brew Act really reduces the federal excise tax. Uh, which is, you know, it's levied on a barrel basis per barrel. Uh, and it, it would reduce it for only really the smaller brewers from 6 million barrels down. So that's a Sam Adams, you know, Boston mm-hmm. Beer Brewery Company, that uh, them and below. Whereas the Beer Act reduces taxes on all brewers, including the big guys like Miller Coors and uh, Anheuser-Busch. But that one, while it reduces taxes on the big guys as well, it really reduces it on the very smallest, those who are making less than 15,000 barrels a year, it would eliminate the federal excise tax for them. So we at CEI have looked at both of them, and we really favor the Beer uh, Act over the Small Brew Act just because it it doesn't really pick favorites in the way that the Brew Act does. Uh, It's across the board a tax reduction, and we really – we would just like to see the tax – the federal excise tax be eliminated. And does it have bipartisan support or is one party the other the beer party? Both of them have bipartisan support. Uh, I would say the Small Brew Act uh, has a greater number of supporters at the moment. And I think that's really the PR, uh, you know, it's because it's small brew and they're talking about small businesses. So it really has that PR edge. Is bootlegging a problem or, or is it just not worth it? 
Bootlegging still happens uh, in this country, and it's mostly in those states that have restrictions on the amount, the content, you know, the alcohol content of a beverage, uh, like Mississippi, Alabama. Uh, they still have some laws saying, you know, a container size is too big. Uh, Florida has a weird regulation about the size of a growler. You can have one that's 120 ounces, but not one that's smaller. Uh, you, or you can have one that's 60 ounces, but not one that's 80 ounces. It, you know, a lot of silly laws that that kind of force people to uh, ship some alcohol through the mail, usually. Uh, there is some driving bootlegging that still occurs. Yeah, but most I would expect most bootlegging is moonshine, right? Not beer. No, no, a lot of it is beer because there's uh, there's so the laws about um, distributing beer and selling it are really just if you don't have a license to sell beer, then you're violating the law. So there was a woman recently who was caught in Vermont who was selling cases of a hard to find beer over state lines. Okay, okay. And that is technically bootlegging. So that happens quite a bit. So cottage industry, cottage industry mm-hmm. bootleggers and distributors. Mm hmm. So perhaps it wasn't Ben Franklin who said that uh, beer is proof that God loves us and wants us to be happy, but I think that's a sentiment that's, uh, that's, that's widely felt in the public, and if these changes take place, it might be a little bit easier to get our favorite brew in our favorite store. Michelle, uh, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me on. You have been listening to Michelle Minton, Fellow in Consumer Policy Studies from the Competitive Enterprise Institute, discuss pending changes in beer distribution laws that were created to ease the end of prohibition 80 years ago and are still with us today. I'm your host, Bill Frezza, and this has been Real Clear Radio Hour. Thanks for being with us.